the single greatest impact on ad effectiveness will be showing your ads to humans in the first place. Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, ten years or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we have Dr. Augustine Fu with us today. He's a digital marketer of 25 years and these days an independent cybersecurity and ad fraud investigator. Dr. Fu was Chief Marketing Science Officer at the Advertising Research Foundation and Group Chief Digital Officer at Omnicom's Healthcare Consultancy Group. He's taught digital marketing at NYU and Rutgers University, and he got his PhD at the age of 23 in material science and engineering from MIT. Let's jump straight into it with Dr. Augustine Fu. So Augustine, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sergio, glad to be here. Very good. Um, I wanted to start by asking you what is Foo Analytics? I can see what it does, but what's the purpose behind it? Well, Foo Analytics is the platform. I just gave it a name because uh, I've been working on the technology for about eight years now. But uh, prior to 2020, I had not opened it up to other people to use for themselves. So the way I help clients would be, I would typically screenshot from the analytics dashboard and then deliver the recommendations via PowerPoints. But last year was the first time I opened up the platform to allow others, uh, including clients, to just log in themselves and look at the analytics. So just like people are familiar with using Google Analytics for their website traffic and things like that, uh, they're now able to log into Foo Analytics and start to look at some of the fraud activity and the bot activity that either impacts their sites or their ad impressions. So Foo Analytics has two parts. Uh, one is the site analytics, where we put the code on the web pages. And then the second is media analytics, where we put the tags in the programmatic ads themselves, whether it's display ads or video ads. And it's really designed to enable the analytics practitioner to have the data so that they can see for themselves, uh, you know, first of all, where their ads ran and whether the ads were shown to humans versus bots because once they have that kind of background data and they understand why something is marked fraudulent or not, they can take action. Like they can see, oh, well, here's a mobile app that's eating up a bunch of our impressions, or here's a website that has 100% Android traffic, which is abnormal, right? So then they can turn those uh, domains and apps off in their own campaigns. So it's really trying to empower them to be able to detect and reduce the fraud themselves, as opposed to some of the commercial uh, solutions on the market, which I call black box fraud detection, because they just tell you a number like 10% IVT, but they don't explain how they got the number and you don't know where the bots came from. So you can't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I have to say I've used it, you know, mm-hmm. but I've used it uh, in another way. And I wanted to explore that angle, which is the privacy angle. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in, in GDPR compliance and, and I guess CCPA or CCPRA now, mm-hmm. Um, we care a lot about data flows, personal yes. data flows. We need to, to document them. And and I found your tool useful to do that as well. I know that it isn't meant, or probably isn't meant for that, but the fact that there's a data flow, the first thing that we need to do is qualify that it's a personal data flow. So, you know, and, as you know, personal data in GDPR is not the same yeah. as PII, in sort of yeah. the US, uh, you know, name for it. But still, being able to tell how data is changed in hands, and once you know you can qualify that data, sort of pseudonymous data or cookie-related data or profiling data, uh, I guess we can inform plenty of things in terms of compliance and even international data transfers. What do you think about that? 
So I think you're, you're talking specifically about the page x-ray tool. So people can find that at page xray.fuanalytics.com. Yeah. And it's a free tool. And what we do is we actually use a headless Chrome browser to load the web page. But instead of just looking at the static contents of the page, we allow the JavaScript to execute because the vast majority of ad tech uh, happens through JavaScript, right? The ads are called by JavaScript, the bids are loaded and so on and so forth. By allowing the JavaScript to execute, we actually get to see what calls what because sometimes one JavaScript calls in another five JavaScript things and then those JavaScript call in another 10 JavaScript things. So there becomes like this tree graph and that's really the purpose of the page x-ray, right? We take an x-ray of the page and then we plot everything kind of in a tree graph so that you can see what JavaScript led to what uh, other JavaScript and then the ad. And in doing so, I was kind of surprising, like when, when I started looking at web pages, some of these tree graphs are enormous, right? So you, you might have hundreds of these calls uh, from the page that you would never see if you just looked at view source, right? Because when you're viewing source, it's just the static parts of the page and you never see those JavaScript things. But the point is related to the topic of privacy is that most users don't understand the amount of ad tech JavaScript or code that's on the page. And even though they're interacting with one site, like they went to New York Times, they don't realize there's 100, 200, 300 other things being loaded in the background, which they don't see. Hmm. And it's those things, the ad tech trackers and the ad servers that are potential compliance issues for both the site and for the marketers, because the question is whether those, um, those ad tech providers have proper consent, right? So under the new privacy regulations, they probably don't. And the reason for that is the human knows that they're interacting with the New York Times webpage, but they certainly don't know who these other ad tech companies are, right? If they said, if Crux asked them for consent, who the heck is Crux, Crux or Lodemy or LiveRamp or any of these other uh, ad tech names that they've never heard of. So in those cases, um, you know, the page x-ray tool is meant for privacy researchers to take a look at uh, what calls what. And then you might notice we put little flags on next to each of the domains because that's where the server is located. So when it comes to EU citizens and you know, especially like German citizens, because Germany has the strictest interpretation of GDPR, even the IP address is considered PII. We want to know if any of that data is leaving the EU and going to other countries, right? So if we see that in the data flow, that's a no-no, right? And so privacy researchers can use that to discover those flows and report it. Very good. You're right. Germany was the first to to say IP address was personal data, but now it is personal data across yeah. uh, all of the EU. It's uh, pseudonymous data. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a very good one. Um, what do you think about consent? Since you're talking about a chain of custody and the chain of consent, mm -hmm. and as you say, I may know I'm visiting the New York Times and I may understand what they're asking me when they refer to things that I can say. Yeah. But as you say, what's happening is this sort of a Trojan horse where one script or one sort of tag management script calls another one which embeds another one. Yeah. And it seems to have no end. So do you, I mean, as you know, the IAB and, and plenty of people in ad tech believe strongly that consent management platforms do the job when it comes to gathering consent. What's your point of view on that? Yes, it's necessary, right? Because right now we have these uh, privacy regulations and, and good companies have to comply with it. So it's very hard for them to build out their own consent management platforms. And furthermore, we need some kind of standardization because you know we don't want every site to build their own version of it. So that's a good thing. But the problem comes in with user experience, right? Because when we have a website and we've seen some of these mainstream publishers, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to gather consent. But when you present a consent pop-up, that has a hundred ad tech vendors in there and the consumer has to check off every single one and say, yes, I give consent. Yes, I give consent a hundred times. They're not gonna do that, right? So there's a concept of informed consent. 
which is also extremely difficult because um, you know we know most users, most human users at least, when they see a user agreement, they just click accept, right? They literally don't read it. And even if they tried to read it, it's all legalese. They don't yeah. understand anyway, right? So there's a similar phenomenon here when they're presented with a very onerous consent pop-up. Sometimes they'll abandon, other times they'll just click accept all. So yeah. it's still not really uh, informed consent. So yeah. while I think it's necessary, I do think that the, the, it goes back to, it's almost like a bandage on top of a problem that exists right now because of ad tech. So it goes back to, you know, why are we collecting all this information about all these users? It's because of the belief in ad tech and the belief that they sold to marketers that you need all this targeting data to target users. So that's why they're collecting everything from search terms to the URLs and the sites that they visit uh, to even the products they look at on Amazon because they think that more data means better targeting and better, more relevant ads. But unfortunately, you know, in studying the effectiveness of marketing, uh, there's now mounting evidence to show that, you know, despite all that targeting data, it's really not yielding any incremental business outcomes, which means, you know, there's a couple of reasons for that, right? Some of the targeting data might be bad. It might be stale, meaning the data's old, right? So if a person looked up some baby clothes on Amazon, okay, they might've had a, a baby or they might be buying baby clothes for their friend's baby, right? So a lot of those things you can't really definitively assume simply by looking at what site they visit or what products they look at, right? So a lot of those things are assumed. And then you have these vast audiences that uh, these ad tech companies or these data sellers try to sell to marketers. And then marketers think that they're targeting all these audiences, right? Because the theory is one-to-one -one targeting in digital. And that's led a lot of marketers to say, oh, let's collect all this data, right? Privacy invasive data collection surveillance marketing, if you will, to, to do that kind of marketing. But if they started to realize that this targeting data is actually less useful than they thought it would, was, right, then they need less and less of it. So I think overall, we, we are seeing the pendulum swing back in this way, which is better for consumer privacy, and in fact, better for marketing, because a lot of these marketers have paid extra to buy all this targeting data. And if they start to realize that it's really not performing as well as they think, they may not need to buy as much of that. And therefore, the ad tech companies may not need to do as much surveillance marketing and data gathering, gathering right? That's uh, privacy invasive. Very good, very good. So it, it does seem like the stars are aligning, but of course, from our point of view, and we are sort of a, of a bubble as well when it comes to uh, looking for a plan B to again, to ad tech and, and RTP and, and profiling and mm -hmm. in essence, doing things that people don't understand and have no control over. But at some point, it's going to crack somewhere first. And, yes. um, and, and you said something earlier on. Everything is aligned and it's connected. But as you said, whoever has spent many years in digital marketing will find it very hard to accept that yes. the pillars that make her or him a professional yeah are sort of crumbling so what's gonna happen first in your estimation meaning one thing could be okay this is not working i think people find it very hard to accept and i keep seeing all sorts of ways to justify it another yeah. one would, would be right um i see i am bothering people so based on what you were saying earlier on there's all these scripts, people don't get it, they're getting annoyed, even consent requests are painful, they're annoying. Everything is pretty annoying. So maybe consumers themselves are telling me I shouldn't use so much either from the point of view of the advertiser or the publisher. And of, of course, if I stop measuring so much, then I will, it will have a positive side effect on privacy. But which one do you think is going to be the one thing that gets people to change. Um, it's neither of those two things, Very good. and it's actually the virus. <laughs> so let me let me do a quick recap. Um, it's very difficult for people to acknowledge they've made a mistake, 
right? So for the marketers who have been buying into this ad tech stuff for 10 years, they're not going to say, oh, whoops, sorry, I made a mistake and I bought the wrong thing, right? They're never going to do that, right? So either, um, you know, they'll be laid off and then, you know, uh, some other marketer comes on that has a more open mind, right? Then we'll see some change. So it's not going to be them acknowledging that they did something wrong. So that's not going to happen. The second is um, I don't rely on a lot of people to do the right thing. So, you know, because they believe so much that uh, targeting more targeting means better ads, they're not going to be ones to say, oh, I'm sorry, I track so much data of you and sorry, I'm going to track less of you right now. Right. They're not going to do that. So what I mean by the virus causing this change is in the middle of 2020, we saw a lot of the marketers actually pull back their spending or at least pause their digital ad spending. And to their surprise, to some of them, they saw no change in business outcomes. In fact, sometimes the business outcomes went up and some of that has nothing to do with uh, the virus or their digital marketing, right? Toilet paper went up because people wanted to buy more toilet paper, right? Demand just went up. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff related to that where people are just buying more. E even laptops and PCs all of a sudden after 10 years of decline uh, jumped up because now people needed more laptops in the home, right? For their kids and whatever, because they're doing homeschooling. So a lot of these things were kind of surprising. That's a shock to the system. So the virus has caused a shock to the system. And, you know, it's causing marketers to do things they would never have voluntarily done before, which the is forcing the test that you yeah, were referring turn, to. Them. Yeah, turn off the marketing, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. I've been telling people the best way to test whether your marketing works is to turn it off for a period yeah. of time. Yeah. No one was willing to do that. But when the, when the virus forced them to pause it for a few months, now they're actually being more careful in terms of what they turn back on. So that has good ripple effects across a lot of things, right? So now, you know, whether it's fraud detection, whatever, whatever, they're, they're taking a closer look and that's the important thing. And so when they start to realize that, wow, we've been spending all this money on ad tech targeting and it really didn't drive much more business or much incremental business or any incremental business for us, why are we paying for it? Right? Because now they're in a little bit more of a saving money mindset and that's a good thing, right? So then they're, they're less wasteful, they're less just blindly spending because they spent before, right? Very often I hear this like, oh, well, we, we keep buying it because we've always bought it, right? That's not a good reason to keep buying it, right? Uh, so now that they've yeah. seen this kind of data, uh, it's actually helpful for them to take a closer look. Yeah, I really wanted to dig into that because uh, I think that that's very important um, to me to understand. You were talking about in one of your many articles on Forbes about look back windows and, um, yeah. you know, looking at what you would have sold anyway, even yes. taking into account seasonality and so on. Yes. And then being a bit more, the way I interpret that is being a bit more long term. So looking yes. at the whole period instead. Of, but of course, what I believe people are afraid of is that if they disconnect, even the look back window was affected, was sort of changed against the natural order of things. Um, there, there's a couple of issues in here. So the, the last thing you just said was that a lot of marketers fear pausing their spend because their competitors might might not pause, right? So it's almost like, oh, I don't want to pause my spend because you know they're not going to do that. So I'm afraid I'm going to lose sales. However, there are certain products and I'm going to use a simple example. Like I grew up in Texas, so we drank Dr. Pepper you know, primarily and not Pepsi and Coke. And when I came up here to New York in the Northeast, I said, where's the Dr. Pepper? They don't even sell it around here, right? So there are certain products that people just naturally buy. And no matter how much advertising Coke and Pepsi do, I'm not just going to go start drinking Pepsi because I grew up with Dr. Pepper and I like Dr. Pepper more. So in some of those cases, even if Coke and Pepsi turn off their advertising, you know, it's not going to affect uh, the sales or Dr. Pepper turned out the, the advertising, I'm still going to buy Dr. Pepper. So people, you know, the marketers need to be a little bit more advanced and sophisticated and realize that, you know, just turning off the ad spend is not necessarily going to be um, the reason sales decline. Now, that being said, um, I do think that uh, doing incrementality or measuring incrementality is very hard. And that's because measuring cause and effect is very hard. Now it comes down to 
to me something very simple. A lot of marketers assume that their ad drove the sale, but you know maybe it it holds true in terms of smaller ticket items like super soda, right? These are you know things that people don't think a lot about. But when it com- comes to cars, computers, houses, or maybe ski vacations, I'll, I'll use that example in just a second. Um, those are bigger ticket items that people tend to research a little bit more and plan ahead because it costs a lot of money, right? So they want to be a little bit more uh, conservative b- before they uh, spend it. So in those cases, um, the marketing or one particular ad, like a display ad or a search ad or even a TV ad, that one ad did not cause the sale, right? It's it's erroneous to believe that your ad caused the sale. It might be, a, it should actually be thought of as a bunch of different touch points. So I think I like to think of it as a media sequence, right? So there's, there's a couple of different touch points. You know, you might've seen a TV ad, then you go online and search for something about the ski vacation, right? And then you see a search ad, and then you might see a few more things before you ultimately decide to buy the ski vacation, right? And in those cases, it's the entire media sequence that impacts your decision to buy, right? And in fact, it might impact your decision to go to Vail for your ski resort, uh, ski vacation, as opposed to a different resort like Beaver Creek, right? So Vail would have won that uh, ski ski vacation. So in those cases, the media sequence is important, uh, and also the look back window is important. So getting to the incrementality question. Uh, are you actually driving more sales than would have happened anyway, right? So in the, in the terms of the, the ski vacation, this was the example I used in the article. Uh, what Vail does with a platform called Arrivalist is they look at a look back window of at least 12 months because, you know, ski vacations have seasonality. So there's winter skiing and spring skiing. So they have to look at what we call arrival rates. So the rate of people arriving in Vail uh, during winter ski- skiing and spring skiing. So that kind of establishes a baseline, right? So you'll see two bumps in that curve. There's an increase ar- in arrival rate uh, during winter skiing and also during spring skiing. The question is whether your marketing activity or your advertising is driving a lift in arrival rate. So something greater than that baseline. Right. So that's why look back windows are important for you to establish that baseline of sales that would have happened anyway, or the arrival rate of people coming to Vail anyway. Or the so drop, you can see, Eve. Or the drop, yeah. That and then you can by see. Marketing the previous year. That's right. That's right. So then you can actually see, okay, when I turn on advertising, did that arrival rate go up? Right. Yeah. So some of those things, I, I won't get into too much detail here, but that's really how you measure incrementality properly. So as you can imagine, it's kind of hard. And a lot of people may be just too lazy to do that because it's way easier to say, oh, here's a spreadsheet. Here's, you know, 10 billion impressions that we bought or you got 1 million clicks. Those are great. And I kind of think of that as watching sports, right? Because here in America, you know, we we love watching football and bigger numbers means they win, right? So the score is higher here versus there. So I think a lot of digital marketing that I'm seeing today is kind of like sports watching. So when you see bigger numbers uh, in the dashboards or the Excel spreadsheets, you say, yay, we win. Mm-hmm. But that's not actually marketing. That's watching yeah, sports. There's even gambling, right? <laughs> that's right. For, for that's keywords. Right. Uh, so the fact that there's a sequence, as you mentioned, that has been the justification for another industry. And that one is flourishing. And uh, or that keeps growing. And it's not just attribution as a marketing itself, as defined by sort of Garner attribution mm-hmm. tools or multi-touch attribution. But there's the whole trend towards trying to understand at individual level, which touch points drove the sale. There's something that is very easy to communicate and sell as a pitch yeah. to marketers. And so my question would be, having seen this evolve and eventually sort of all of it flow into one idea, which is the 360 view of the customer. And every marketer the, these days is trying to put together this picture. And it, in a way, it justifies plenty of, the, plenty of the campaigns and much of the investment where the reward is not the actual sales, but the data resulting from it so yeah. that they can build a better picture. And in the long term, target you better. 
But I think it's part of the same thing. So if we address everything from the ad spend point of view, then yes, there's a strong case to be made that that cannot be measured properly as it is and so on. But if we address it from the data management point of view and how the customer data platform has become a sort of new standard where yeah. we used to have DMP and then CRM. And so everyone is trying to build this 360 view of the customer in the hope that one day, yes, you will, you will be able to predict what people are going to do. That happens at individual level. Yeah. Do you have any faith in that? No, and it's actually based on a flawed uh, logic. So basically, advertisers are now trying to use attribution platforms and the data that they collect to attribute a particular sale to a particular person caused by a particular ad. And just like we said before, one particular ad did not drive the sale. Right. One display ad doesn't drive the sale. One TV ad doesn't drive the sale. One print ad alone doesn't drive the sale. So here, the flawed logic is them trying to attribute a particular sale to a particular person because of a particular ad, and that's flawed. What they're losing sight of is the fact that, or what marketers used to do, which is, did an advertising campaign cause more sales? I don't need to know the individual out of the 100,000 customers that bought more of our product. I just need to know that there's 100,000 more people that bought our product, right? So in that case, we're, we're delving too deep uh, into the data to a point where it's almost like more is better or more data, you know, more granular data. We have 300 data points on this one person. They think it's better. But you know they're they're kind of losing sight of the the overall objective of advertising. Did it drive any sales? Yeah, very so good. I think you know in in digital, it's because we have this abundance of data. Everyone gets so enamored with oh, let's gather more for this person, but then they're actually moving further away from the actual uh, objective of advertising, which is to drive more sales. What do you think would be the best or most effective thing? that anyone in the MarTech space or even the ad tech space or even the publishing space could do to try and move the needle towards an environment where people understand what data is being collected about them, they're in control, there's more transparency, and at the same time, advertisers are not being taken for a ride. Um, there's actually nothing that the ad tech com ad tech uh, sector can do to do that because they will not willingly do that, right? They have been the ones, they have been the snake oil salesmen who have been selling marketers on the idea that they can do one-to-one -one targeting, behavioral targeting, hyper-targeting. They will not be the ones to uh, dispense with that. What's going to happen is what we're seeing right now, which is uh, because of the pandemic in 2020, we're seeing a lot of consolidation and some of these small ad tech companies literally go out of business. And furthermore, because of privacy regulation, we're going to see more of these data brokers, data sellers go out of business because their entire business is not legal, right? Is not compliant. So when that happens, more and more marketers will force to be going back to more traditional advertising, right? So you know, I don't mean like go all the way back to the days of TV advertising where you could only place ads on TV shows and get very rough approximations of audiences, right? You will go back to placing ads on legitimate publishers like New York Times, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and things like that. These are mainstream publishers that have human audiences, right? And so I've said recently, the single greatest impact on ad effectiveness will be showing your ads to humans in the first place. And what that means is that they don't have to buy these hundreds of billions of ads on programmatic channels on long tail sites that no one's ever heard of, which don't have a lot of human visitors going to them. So when the marketers start doing that, they'll realize, oh, well, if I just place my ads on mainstream sites and get the ads shown to humans, I'm getting better outcomes than all the stuff that we were spending money on through ad tech and programmatic channels. Once more and more marketers realize that, then they'll say, oh, well, we don't need as much of that anymore, 
right? And so there's going to be this, again, pendulum swing, right? We, we've seen this pendulum swing to the extreme where we are now living in surveillance marketing times, right? But I think the pendulum is swinging back the other way for the good of consumers' privacy, as well as for the good of marketers' outcomes, right? They're going to actually end up inadvertently doing better marketing because yeah. they're not wasting so much money on ad tech snake oil. Yeah. Much of the surveillance we have today is a product of the open market, having many players in the middle. And, and something that we hear a lot from ad tech is that where this is going is towards more and more money in the hands of the world gardens. And I know yes. you've, been, you've been writing a few powerful things about how inaccurate the metrics are and yeah. so on. But still... The fact that you have a direct relationship, very much like you would with the New York Times or even programmatic contextual, yes, um, then it means that it makes all the sense that there's less competition when it comes to demand generation and that we all end up in the hands of Google, Facebook, Amazon. How do we escape that as people run away from the ad tech ecosystem or the RTB or the open market? How do we make sure that we don't end up giving it all to let, let me let them. me put it this way if i were a marketer with a budget i would actually prefer to give my ad dollars to google and facebook and amazon before i would give it to any ad tech player and for the reason you just said i am logged into google right i as a consumer am logged into google whether it's logged into gmail or youtube or I'm even logged into my Android device, right? So Google sees all that. And I know I'm interacting with Google because I get free Gmail to use, right? And I've willingly volunteered various pieces of information like my age, my ge geographic location, things like that. So out of all the ad tech players, Google has the best data. Uh, you can think of that as first party data as opposed to ad tech companies collecting third party data. Uh, so Google has the best data. So if I were doing advertising marketing and doing digital, I would do search ads with Google. I would also do um, display ads with Facebook. Now there's caveats to both of those, right? Uh, for Google, I would turn off search partners and Google display network to make sure my ads run on Google itself to avoid the fraud. That's a different issue. Uh, and then for display ads on Facebook, I would turn off FAN which is Facebook audience network, which are all the outside sites and apps that carry their ads. And in doing so, again, people are logged into Facebook and they volunteered a bunch of information. So in terms of ad targeting, Facebook has the best uh, you know, targeting and best uh, available data on that person. Because everything else in the, on the outside, these ad tech companies, you know, for example, they have their trackers on New York Times. They're collecting data on that consumer uh, first of all, the consumer doesn't know and didn't give consent, and also they don't have recourse. And then furthermore, the data that is collected is used to derive insights that may not be accurate, right? So the best illustration of this is some of the researchers have shown that these uh, data sellers will mark a particular cookie, which is a representation of the person as both male and female, yeah. because they literally don't know. You know, and, you know, where, what do you derive from that cookie when they visit a Walmart or an Amazon, right? You can't derive anything from that, but yet they derive all these insights to be used for creating audience segments that they charge money for. So as you can see, both the data is collected in a non-compliant way, but the insights that are derived from it and the audience segments that are created from it are also flawed. So if I were to do marketing, you know, it, it's kind of like all the ad tech companies hate this because it means less money in their pocket and more money in terms of Google and Facebook. But for me, again, as a consumer and as a privacy advocate, I would rather have Google be in charge of my privacy because at least they have some standards and policies in place versus all these hundreds of unknown ad tech companies that I don't know and have zero recourse if they take my data, right? So unfortunately, you know, even as a privacy uh, researcher and advocate, um, Google and Facebook are the lesser of the two evils compared to ad tech. So I would yeah. still not give it to ad tech. Many people would say then that if we all go to what is more privacy friendly 
because of the, again, first party relationship and less prone to fraud and, and brokerage because of that. So Google, Facebook, Amazon. At the same time, the fact that there's little competition by the nature of the service, which favors aggregating around the single service for yeah. again, search and so on, it means that them having a sort of a bottleneck or us, all of us finding a bottleneck when it comes to demand generation means that it takes a pretty big slice out of any, any business's revenue and that every day we will find, find it harder to accommodate that sort of walled garden tax in our business model. Do you see that happening as flowing into these platforms and as a result being priced out? Um, no, I, I think, you know, for small businesses, I would be very specific in my recommendations, right? Do search on Google and turn off search partners. Do display on Facebook and turn off FAN. Do video on YouTube and handpick the channels, the creators that uh, you've seen before and you want your ads to show up next to, right? As opposed to, so it's kind of like a whitelist versus a, you know, spray and pray and then hope you can avoid the bad stuff. Yeah. So in those cases, um, that's how I would recommend a small business with very, very small and finite budgets to do their digital marketing. Um, the, the part about Google and Facebook having a lot of power and the part about them being privacy unfriendly, those are all true. But let me put it this way. I, I, I'm just borrowing a phrase from someone. I, I don't remember who, but they said it very well. Um, Google and Facebook are better for privacy in relative terms, meaning they're better than the third party ad tech companies in terms of privacy relatively. But in absolute terms, they're not good for consumer privacy at all because they have full power. Right. So in those cases, um, again, it comes down to as a consumer, I've made the conscious choice. I know Google's tracking everything about me, but I'd rather have one company, Google, do that than a hundred other smaller no name ad tech companies who are definitely selling my data to somebody else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think this future for media agencies, since they are pushing large advertisers towards, again, you know, the open ecosystem where they can make a margin. Yeah, there's going to be less and less need for them. I mean, the whole point of programmatic is you let the algorithms, uh, you know, do the, do the work. So yes, there's going to be a little more upfront work to set up the programmatic campaigns, but then there shouldn't be a ton of work maintaining them. They should just run and then you're optimizing and tweaking. So, you know, I've witnessed these large agencies, they're, they're doing so much extra work because they make money on billable hours, completely unnecessary when you have AI and ML and, and all that kind of stuff. So the, even the media agency business model is going away to a large extent. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for all of that. Any books or readings or anything that you would recommend if you have it, have it off, your, off the top of your head? No, actually, because I just publish based on, you know, what I read and see and debate and talk about every day. That's kind of the pulse of what's going on now. I mean, by the time you see academic papers or books, it's just way too late already. Augustine, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. We'll talk again soon. I hope so. Okay, that's all for today. Please find episode notes and links to our social channels and other feeds mastersofprivacy.com please do not give us five stars on your favorite podcasting channel unless you believe there is no more room for improvement your candid feedback is probably more useful to us thank you <laughs>